On this episode of Sports Opinions Podcast, Matt Babcock of Babcock Hoops joins the show as we talk about his career as an NBA agent and Babcock Hoops and what's currently going on with that, the current state of the NBA, Team USA Basketball and their chances uh, to bring home the gold in the worlds, and his beloved Red Sox and their struggles this season. And without further ado, cue the intro. What's up, sports fans, and welcome to the Sports Opinions Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Alex Cuesta, and with me today is a guy that you will come to find out when we're talking basketball, he knows it. It is Matt Babcock. He is a former NBA agent of 11 years. He's the current owner of Babcock Hoops and also a co-owner of Pro Insight. What's going on, Matt? Hey, Alex, not too much. How are you doing? Good, good. Now, you know, I mentioned that if we're talking hoops, you're a guy that knows it. You have a lot of past credentials of hoops, but you also grew up quite literally around the NBA. Can you quickly just give a quick rundown and delve into why I say that and all of your family that is not only currently involved, but has been involved? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, so I was born to a basketball family, like, like you mentioned. Uh, you know, my childhood, my, my dad was a college coach, so we kind of bounced around different schools. And he got into the NBA when I was in middle school. Uh, but before then, my, my two uncles had both worked in the NBA you know, before, before I was even born. And uh, my Uncle Pete, I think he started in the NBA in the late 70s. And uh, so we've, we, we go back pretty far with the NBA. And uh, my dad's been with the Milwaukee Bucks for 21, 22 years now. Um, and then now my uh, two younger cousins are assistant coaches for the 76ers and the Hawks. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely awesome. And, you know, you're living – you probably, it was just normal growing up being around basketball. But for someone like me, who's just been a fan, like you're kind of living the dream of a, you know, kid that got to grow up around professional athletes and professional sports. And now you, you've had a fun life yourself. Um, you played college ball. Um, you have a weird experience playing college ball. We talked a little bit about it. And then you took that into being an agent and now in the media. First, tell me about your college basketball experience, which you wrote about on Babcock Hoops. Yeah, sure. You know, I uh, you know grew up grew up you know visualizing being a basketball player. Um, you know, I did did pretty well. I didn't I didn't grow quite as as uh, as tall as I had hoped I would. I, I'm only <laughs> six one. My dad's six five. I was six one when I was a freshman in high school, and you know, yeah, I, high uh, hopes. High I was, hopes yeah, yeah, and I was getting I was getting hyped up as uh, you know six five point guard. You know, and uh, anyway, I, I ended up. Uh, I developed into a pretty good player. Got recruited playing college. I played at a JUCO in Florida. Um, the the reason for going to the JUCO was to you know increase increase my stock. I, I'd gotten some uh, some offers from some low D ones, but I, I thought I was better. You know, like every other 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 kid, and uh, went there. You know, had a bunch of knee problems, and then uh, you know my my dad obviously well connected. You know, at, at, uh, after the second year, I I got hurt two years in a row, and uh, sort of put me on the market as an option for big schools if I would walk on for a year and they would scholarship me for the remaining years I was eligible you know, who would be interested and uh you know everybody came knocking and long story short um you know I grew up in Arizona I grew up a U of A fan and you know Lou Dolson and his staff showed interest and they want to bring me on and so I walked off walked on in the University of Arizona and you know at that point it was it was more of a deal where I was, I was checking out of my playing career and, and looking to do something uh that could benefit me you know for the next chapter, which I, I knew would be in basketball in some, some capacity. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that you went to Arizona because uh, I actually followed Arizona. My first name is Alex, obviously. And when I was a young kid playing NCAA games, just a big badass a for the Arizona Wildcats. Mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, that's cool. And it was also like one of the first teams to show up when you're selecting a team. Sure. So <laughs> I was, you know, I was really entrenched. And then also, I grew up when Damon Stoudemire was big. And that's who I latched onto. And I saw and I was like, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> so, oh, no, you're absolutely. It was actually the big impression. Uh, the, the guy that made a big impression on me, too, was uh, my dad was an assistant coach at Northern Arizona. I think I was six or seven years old. And uh, Northern Arizona played at U of A. And I went on, you know, on the team bus with the team. Uh, that was my first time going into McHale. And they played Damon Stoudemire. Chris Mills was on that team. I think Sean Brooks. 
Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's when I was sold and it was just, Hey, this, this is as good as it gets. And, uh, you know, so you get an opportunity to go play basketball there, you, you do it. Um, and then, you know, funny enough, um, Damon's cousin, Salim was, was my teammate cool. and my workout partner who was just an incredible college player. And, yeah. you know, he, he didn't have uh, quite as good an NBA career as, as, you know, we all would have hoped, but I mean, in college, oh, that guy was un, unreal. Now I have to ask you, and you now having ties to Arizona, obviously growing up liking them as well, like I did, why do they keep on disappointing us? Why do they have such great teams and then they can't seem to close it out lately? Like they've, they're, they are one of the blue collars. They're the pedigrees. They're right up there with the Kentuckys, the Kansas, but they have, they have DeAndre Ayton who they should have dominated the world with and they can't close out. They get eliminated early. What do you see right now with that program? That is it mental right now where they get to a point and it's so much pressure there. They just can't jump over the hump right there. You know, I, I think college basketball is, is a tough business. You know, I mean, the, these big schools, they're depending on, you know, 18 and 19 year olds to carry them. And, you know, you, you, you pretty much recruit as, as good a player as you possibly can and you make it work. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's tough to, you know, to, to really project who is going to develop at a fast enough rate to, to, you know, win you a championship. Obviously you have some schools, I mean, you know, Izzo does a really good job of recruiting local kids and, you know, keeps a lot of them a little bit longer that, you know, Virginia, the same thing. Um, yeah, right. You know, I, 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 yeah, exactly. So I, I think, I mean, a lot of it's circumstantial, you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, teams got to get hot. They got to, you know, find the right matchups. You know, it's just, it's a tough business. I, I don't think there's necessarily anything broken. Um, it's just, you know, the, the, this things got to fall their way. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's, I, I actually think they're gonna be pretty good this year. I mean, the, the freshmen they have coming in are really, really good. Yeah. I'm hoping that they're going to be, you know, back to being, Arizona that we know that goes and just gets on runs and wins championships because I want that. <laughs> um, you also spent 11 years, over a decade, being an NBA agent, which is something that, you know, I grew up, I was young when Arliss was on, but that was like my impression of a sports agent. Right. Was <laughs> kind of fan, a little fantasy there, but it's, that's really cool as well. What did you learn from being a sports agent? If I remember correctly reading, you negotiated – the most lucrative deal for a second round pick ever. And some of the more lucrative deals for any draft picks. So you had experience and you had success as an agent. What did you learn from being an agent and why did you walk away? Um, well, to give you a little background, how I, I got into the agent sort of answers why I got out. Uh, so when I, when I left Arizona, I took a, a summer internship with Wasserman Media Group, which at the time was the biggest sports agency in, in all of sports. And uh, my job was to assist Dave Yeager, who, who ended up being you know, the head coach of the you know, Grizzlies and the Kings. He, he and I did all of their pre-draft workouts. And we had, I think, seven first-round picks that year. Um, and I did some stuff in the office. That was sort of my first real taste of the agency world. Um, I, I, even, even then, I, even when I finished that internship, I still didn't think about being an agent. I took a job as an assistant coach, development coach in a, with a pro team in Italy. And, uh, you know, long story short, I, I kind of got homesick and I, I got offered a job by another big agency, Excel Sports Management. And they had sort of talked to me about grooming me to be an agent, you know, being a junior agent, the, the whole thing. And so I, I went and did that. And, uh, it just kind of took off from there. I just kind of fell into it and it was sort of a slippery slope. I, I was, I was somewhat of a hot commodity with all these agents just because of how well connected you know, I was within basketball. So I, mean, I bounced around, I worked for a bunch of different agencies and, you know, it was sort of one of these things where next thing I knew, you know, I was an agent on my own. I had my own client list and I had, you know, put 11 years into this business and, uh, you know, I, I just sort of you know looked in the mirror and said, Hey, this is not, this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. And uh, not that there's, you know, the one thing that like kind of pushed me out the door that there is a lot of negatives that, that are well documented. Um, you know, it's a stressful industry. It was more, I just, I wanted to get back closer to my roots and, and do something a little bit more directly basketball related, which is what my plan was you know, pretty much since I was a little kid. So I have to ask you being a former agent, how do you feel about the rich ball rule at the NCAA now rescinded their initial rule have to have a high school to, uh, college bachelor degree in order to be it. They rescinded it because I think they realized it was wrong. How did you feel about it when it came out? You know, uh, I mean, you bring up the NCAA, I, I have to sort of, you know, think carefully of what I'm going to say. So I don't you know, create too many enemies here. <laughs> it, uh, I mean, my, my first reaction, this is a total joke. It, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if somebody's getting certified by the players union, that, that should be enough for, for these guys to represent them. I mean, the NCAA does, I don't think they have a good grip of how, how you know, how, how the protocols work. 
you know, with the agency business, with the MBA, and they just kind of, uh, they just kind of do things on their own. They, they don't really communicate, um, you know, with the MBA or the players union. And, and really what, what's silly about it is, you know, it's, it was, you know, somewhat of a slap in the face to Rich Paul, who's, you know, kind of turned into one of the, the high powered guys within, within the sport. Um, it, it was just, but it, you know, what's funny about it is, it really wouldn't have stopped him from doing much. It would just be a headache. He, he, there, the loophole would be he has another agent in his office, technically represent the guys. The union does not have a problem with guys that are not the certified agent calling teams. The only thing that you're not legally allowed to do is sit in the room and formally negotiate the contract, uh, which the way I understand it is Rich Paul has Mark Termini, another agent, help him with negotiations anyway. So, I mean, it's really – it really wouldn't affect that much. It's just sort of an annoying headache if they were to keep that in one place. But yeah, long story short, it's a joke. Yeah, I'm happy that they rescinded it and they're now saying, no, you know, as long as you get certified, you're good. So we're yet to see how bad the certification process is. They know they laid it out, but we all know the NCAA. I know you do a lot of draft stuff, so you can't criticize them too much. You rely on them. But the NCAA does a lot of things backwards. I have plenty of problems. I'm a former track athlete, Division One athlete at Marist College, so I have a lot of problems with the NCAA in general. But I digress. I don't want to get either of us in too much trouble. <laughs> right. um, currently, you now have Babcock Hoops. You are a co-owner of Pro Insight. You have a lot of NBA draft heavy stuff that you do. You are the dedicated few in your group that really studies all of this stuff. I have to ask you. Being a JUCO kid, you have a soft spot for JUCO kids that work their tails off, go JUCO, get the big school, and then try and make it through the draft. Yeah, no, I mean, I could appreciate that that process. I mean, I think the the JUCO route has changed quite a bit. You know, my my dad was a JUCO coach for a while when I was a kid, and uh, back back in the '90s and the early 2000s, when when I was there, it, it was it was a much higher level. I mean, the, the, what's really changed the landscape of everything is that there's so many prep schools now and then that, that are operating at a high level. That's, that's more of the option now rather than going JUCO. Uh, so it's, you know, the talent levels of, of, of dropped quite a bit. Um, I mean, I, I remember my dad first got in the league, he used to have to go scout JUCOs quite a bit. You know, mm-hmm. there was guys you know, coming straight out, you know, um, I mean, I, Steve Francis ended up going to Maryland. He was considering coming out. Kedrick Brown got drafted in the lottery by the Celtics out of uh, the, actually the same conference I was in in Florida. Uh, there, there's a number of guys, but um, yeah, no, I, I respect guys that grind it out and, you know, whether it's going JUCO or, or, or you know, doing a number of different things. If, if a guy's willing to make sacrifices and, and bust his butt to, to, you know, achieve his goal. Yeah. I respect that. So I alluded a few times to Babcock hoops. Talk to me, tell everyone a little bit about what you guys, you're a small group of you. It looked from what I look like when I scan the website, what are you guys trying to accomplish in Babcock hoops? Uh, what sets you apart in the sports media world from other basketball focused um, groups of writers and experts? Yeah, well, what happened was, you know, when I got out of the agency business, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I played with some ideas. I, you know, I talked to a few NBA teams over, over the course of a couple of years, and you know, push came to shove. I was like, you know, I just, I just want to get out. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I need to, I need to make a drastic move to really kind of dip in on the basketball side and, and, and you know, create a career on, on that side of things. And so what I did was I started scouting for uh, Marty Blake and Associates. It was uh, um, a scouting service that was put put together by the NBA a long time ago. And uh, I really just, you know, scouted for them, cover the draft on, on my own, u- utilizing their umbrella. And I liked it. You know, I, I knew that I wanted to scout, um, you know, college players and, and cover the draft. Um, and then I was approached by Sports Illustrated to write a series of stories for them on the, the pre-draft process. And, uh, you know, I did that you know for a year and just kind of put together an idea of like, hey, why don't I create my own entity? I can control it, you know, do exactly what I want, you know, do my own schedule, write about what I want to um, and also, too, I, I saw there being a need for guys that were in between jobs that have NBA experience. And so, you know, it all kind of came together organically and we put together a group of uh, five of us. Um, we lost one of our guys to the Lakers pretty quickly after he started working with us. But, um, you know, that's that's really what separates us is we all have, uh, you know, direct experience working with the NBA. I, you know, I haven't worked for a team myself, but I grew up in it. You know, I was a certified NBA agent for a long time. Uh, and then all, all of my guys work with me all have uh, NBA scouting experience. And so, um, you know, we're not, you know, we're not pumping out content, but, you know, we like to think that, you know, people might want to listen to us a little closer just because we have, we have, you know, a lot of experience. 
Yeah, experience definitely counts for a lot, especially when it comes to draft stuff, because I feel like experience and having a pulse on seeing a type of player, how they play and kind of comparing it to past players gives you a better understanding of how this player may turn out. Now, I'm curious, you obviously have many a connection to the league in terms of the front office. Did you ever consider going that route and trying to use your connections to get into an NBA front office or in a coaching position? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, that, that's really been my, my plan, you know, like I said, since I was a little kid and uh, you know, really when I left the agency business, that was, that was my real goal. And I, I had, uh, you know, I had, I had one offer that fell through and then, you know, just things, you know, things never really worked out with, you know, a couple teams. And then, uh, you know, I put together all these ideas and it's all kind of taken off. You know, I, I really didn't, didn't really plan for this to, to, you know, you know, be as good as it is. And I, I mean, I'm really proud of what I'm doing. I've got my hands in a lot of good things. Um, and so now I'm at a, a point now where, you know, I, I still would like to work for a team. I just, you know, I, I don't feel the pressure to do it right away. It's just sort of like, Hey, when the right opportunity comes, you know, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, you know, that, that's not necessarily like a financially driven move, but you know, I just, you know, get with a good team, good people somewhere where I could you know, learn and grow. Um, you know, I think I'll do it at some point. I just, I, you know, I don't know when. So I'm a big Brooklyn Nets fan, and you're an awesome basketball mind. So Brett Yomark, Shaw Marks, all of you guys, I'm calling out right now. Hire him. (laughs) Bring him in some capacity. Bring Matt in. Because I would just love to have you a part of the group of players that I love to see and that you had a hand in it. But uh, hopefully they come calling. I doubt they listen to the show, though, Matt. I'm sorry. (laughs) Sorry, I appreciate you saying that. (laughs) So jumping into the NBA – I want to talk, you have so many different angles and it's cool because you were a player, obviously a talented player aspiring to be in the NBA. Then you also had the side of seeing front office life from your family, the agent side that you embarked on. Now the sports media side, you have seen this from every angle. So your input is, I feel like extremely objective because you just are kind of looking at it from the outside, looking in. The current state of the NBA, I, no sport has ever been as player-driven and superstar heavy as this sport. Is it too player-driven at this point where they have all the power and the franchises don't have as much? Or are fans and media kind of running that narrative too heavy? Um, yeah, I, I think it's a little broken. I mean, I, you know, I, the Anthony Davis situation is a little bit alarming. I mean, you know, if, if you're looking at it from – you know, an owner's standpoint, I mean, they're investing millions and millions of dollars into these stars. And, you know, pretty much if a star decides he's unhappy, he, he can make things tough enough on the team that, you know, he, he can force a trade. And I just, that, that, that doesn't sit well with me. You know, I don't have a great answer of how you correct that. Uh, but I do think there needs to be a little bit more balance of, you know, hey, if we're, if we're going to agree to this, this contract, you know, we got to figure out ways of, of you know, both parties honoring it, um, at least at a higher percentage that, than it is right now. Now, I feel like it might just be kind of a numbers game, not even just money wise, because everyone points to, well, the NFL has a good control on it and they have a salary cap, but they also have to pay 53 guys. Where in the NBA, you're only paying 12. So I, I feel like that's where the disparity comes. You can put a cap on it, but the fact that one guy can make such a difference on a basketball team as opposed to one guy on a football team making a big difference, but not the same amount of difference in basketball. I feel like the way it's going now and the marketing and how social media makes these people so much bigger, I don't know if the owners are ever going to get it back at all. Uh, Do you think that there's, you know, you said you don't have much of a solution. As an agent, put your agent cap on. Are you pushing to make this go further so that your players can get more and more? Well, I mean, I think it's happening, nat- you know, happening naturally. Uh, you know, the basketball is just, it's just growing, you know, and it, globally it is, it is just rising quickly. Um, and I, I don't see it slowing down. I mean, that's the big difference between, you know, the NBA and the NFL. I mean, the NFL is probably going to be on a gradual decline. I mean, at least that's, that's my opinion. Um, you know, and then also too, the, the other difference is with those players, you know, you really don't know what the shelf life for a player is. I mean, the injuries are so common and, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to justify giving a, a guy a ton of guaranteed money. Of course, there's injuries in the NBA too. It's just not nearly as, as risky. I mean, I think there's a, there's a bigger risk of a guy getting disgruntled and want, you know, forcing a trade than, than there is him having a career ending injury, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to compare the two, the two sports really. Now 
we have to also look at the LeBron effect because I feel like LeBron has had a major impact on creating this atmosphere because he is the best player of this generation, you know, by far. Sorry, Kobe Bryant, you kind of fall similar to this. LeBron's the best. And his kind of demand of, I'm only going to take a two-year deal with a the player option in the second year because I know you guys are getting more TV money and I'm going to want more money. And he's kind of opened this door for other players that have value to teams to go, yeah, I'm going to do that because you guys want my talent and I'm going to be a member of a big three, but I'm not going to be a member of that big three without making money. When LeBron retires, is there going to be another player like him to lead that charge or the players left, the superstars left going to be able to take that mantle? Or is it just something about LeBron and his retirement will possibly slow it down? You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure they were saying the same thing about Bird and Magic, you know, a little before my time. But, you know, and then with Jordan, is there never ever going to be another guy that's going to be able to take the throne? And it's just there always seems to be a guy that pops up. I mean, nobody saw LeBron come, but here he is. You know, he's been here. He's he's, he's carried the torch for a long time. I mean, Kobe before him. Um you know, I, I think there will be guys on that level. I mean, what, what you're saying as far as how they're handling their contracts, you know, it's a, it's a little, you know, it's a little risky on the players end. I mean, I think what's going to happen is it's going to take one big player to have a devastating injury or get in trouble and like not having that guaranteed money for years, guys are going to probably get a little, you know, a little bit more hesitant to do, keep doing these short term deals. Um, I mean, I'd like to get, I'd like to see, I don't think this is going to happen, but I'd like to see them get, get, get rid of options, get rid of team ops, get player options. Hey, let's put together contracts and let's, let's, you know, stick by them, you know, both, both ends a little bit more, um, you know, in sort of restricting both parties. Again, I don't think that's in the conversation, but I would like to see a little bit more, you know, stability with these teams and these players. Yeah, I would like to see that because the option is such a weapon for both sides, depending on who has the leverage at that time. Obviously, the superstar player has all the leverage to get the player option because you want to sign them to these deals. The team has all the leverage with a kind of mid-level player of giving the team option. So I feel like you would definitely even the playing field by losing the option. Um, A little more lighter side. Who's your favorite to win next year? Because the West, it went from being big threes to dominant duos. I'm, I'm coining that, dominant duos. That's going to be mine. But it went from being big threes to basically dominant duos in the NBA, and the West is packed with them. Who do you have the favorites for next year winning it all? Well, you know, I'm certainly biased. You know, my dad's with the Milwaukee Bucks, and, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he was a big part of, you know, finding Giannis and all that. And uh, I'm, I'm going to stick I'm gonna stick with my boys in Milwaukee. But, um, you know, next year's going to be exciting. I mean, this is about as much parody as there's been in the league since I can even remember, I mean, probably, you know, pre Jordan, you know, sort of like that gap between, you know, bird and magic to the dominant bowls. Um, so it's just, I mean, I think it's up for grabs. I mean, we got, you know, at least a handful of teams that you could consider as, as contenders here. Now I have a soft spot for the bucks because I am a, obviously a Nets fan and Brooke Lopez being on the bucks just makes me so happy to see him have success when he was, the star of the Nets for so many years carrying the mantle and the Nets were just not able to help him ever. So him going to the Bucks makes me super happy. Now Robin joins that fray. They obviously lose um, Brogdon. Do they still have enough there with the addition of Robin Lopez and you know anyone else that they can finagle in there? Will there be enough? Is Giannis going to take the next step with Chris Middleton to be able to get back to that level? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I really like what they did this summer. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, what you're talking about with Brooke, it's really refreshing to see him kind of bounce back. I mean, obviously a great player for years with the Nets and, and he, he's really done a great job of adapting to the new style of play. I mean, he's stretched, he's, you know, he's, he's like a shooter now, you know, I mean, he's, 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 he is like stretching that thing like crazy. It's like the modern day, like, uh, Bill Lambert. It's, it's great. Um, you know, and, and you know, losing Brogdon, obviously, you know, it hurts losing a young high character guy that's, that's productive at, you know you know, for, for the team, but they, I did feel like they had a little bit of a log jam. Like how do we use Brogdon? You know, Bledsoe's playing a lot of minutes. You know, we got Chris, we got Giannis. Um, you know, I, I think, I think they're going to be fine. I, I don't think they're going to, you know, miss a step. And, you know, they, they kept, they kept their really great complimentary players. I thought, I thought Brooke is so important to their offense of just keeping the floor spread for Giannis um, and, and George Hill off the bench, just giving them the versatility of playing both guard spots. Um, I mean, I was really happy to see both of those guys stick. Obviously, Chris being back too, but I, you know, that, I think that was you know, widely expected. Now, you talking about Chris, a nice transition into Team USA. 
Team USA currently is basically devoid of superstars. Besides Kemba Walker and Donovan Mitchell as a budding superstar, they have a lot of young talent, including Brooke Lopez, who isn't young, but he's kind of still on the star fray. They have Kyle Kuzma there. Jason Tatum is there. Um, there's just a lot of young faces. That if you're an NBA fan, you know, but it's not the USA teams that we've been used to seeing pushed out with Melo, LeBron, uh, Darren Williams in his prime, and all these great players. Is this USA team good enough, or are we going to get a disappointment like we got um, before they had to bring in the Redeem team? Well, they're, they're definitely good enough. I mean, if you really break down the rosters, you know, looking at, uh, you know, national teams, I mean, it, there's usually, you know, a, a few NBA level guys, you know, three to five, something like that. Right. And I, I, I've thought this for years that, you know, putting together a bunch of stars, hey, it's great for marketing. You probably generate a lot of ticket sales, jersey sales, the whole thing. If we're talking about strictly basketball. You're better off putting guys in roles that they're used to playing rather than having them adapt. And so, I mean, put together 12, you know, superstars, I mean, that's, 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 that's hard to manage and it's hard to maximize each role. And whereas, I mean, we were talking about Brooke Lopez and he could, he could be himself. I mean, he's, he's there, you know, shoot open shots, stretch the floor. Um, you know, and I think there's a number of guys, you know, within that roster that, that are pretty much just going to be able to play their game and they're probably going to be the best at that role because that's what they do for a living. Now, does it help coach pop and coach Kerr who are coaching the team? Does it help them that a lot of these young guys have played together before if it's not AAU coming up? A lot of these guys, they've been good for a really long time. So they played on national teams and national tournaments in AAU and every level basically together. And now they're all pretty damn friendly in the league. Does that help their job in terms of this might not be the first time that these guys have played together. So the chemistry may already kind of be there. Yeah, that definitely helps. I mean, you know, this day and age, I mean, there's, you know, coming up through the high school ranks, all these guys play at different all-star games, AU tournaments, you know, most of these guys, if they're within a, you know, a few years of each other, they, they know each other. And obviously you get in the NBA, everything, it's a big fraternity. Um, that definitely helps. But, it, you know, I still think they're at a disadvantage playing against the, you know, from that standpoint against international teams, like that's the thing that international teams have. Um, you know, because that's, that's multiplied by a ton because these guys have played with their national team for years and years and years. And the continuity is just so strong. Now, are you, disappointed in any of the other superstars that didn't come play with team USA. Like I don't, I don't knock LeBron. I don't knock some of the veterans that have done it, but kind of guys like Anthony Davis and that whole group of younger superstar. uh, Do you feel any type of way about them kind of snubbing getting the USA another uh, gold? Well, I mean, I I have, I have sort of mixed, mixed emotions there. I mean, as a fan, you know, yeah, I'd love to see all the great, great players play and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, but I mean, the, the business side of me, my eight, you know, put on my agent cap. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't want my superstar client playing. I mean, you know, if, I mean, I think about like, you know, Giannis is playing for Greece. Right. And it's just, I mean, if you're the box, man, that guy gets hurt. It's like, Oh man, <laughs> what, what, what do we do nice now? And, and what's, yeah. where's the upside for us with him playing <laughs> for Greece? And it, uh, so, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I mean, if I were to take a hard stance, I think it's on the player. I mean, how, how much does he value representing his country? Um, you know, if, if it's important to him, hey, go for it. If not, hey, I don't blame you. you know, you've got a lot to lose. There's not a whole lot of upside here. Um, you know, that's your call. Yeah, I think as the money gets bigger, we're going to see less and less superstars representing any nation at all because there is a lot more on them. And I feel like this is the one spot where the teams do have a little bit of power of saying, hey, we need you here. You sign a mega contract. We don't need you getting hurt over there. That goal doesn't mean anything. This NBA championship is what we're all about. So, Or you start paying them. I mean, a lot of these international teams pay their guys. Yeah, I don't think USA is ever going to do that. We, I, don't either, I don't either, but that would, be, that would be the answer. Yeah, yeah. But you know what, though? Also, with, they, with the United States, like their FIBA or basketball, whatever it is, USA basketball, would they ever be able to pay them enough to even comparatively come to what the NBA contracts are? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, if you put together like a real, you know, USA dream team, you probably could figure out a way of generating some pretty good money there. I mean, I, you know, some of these top international players, um, their, their teams are, are paying them pretty good. And I mean, we're talking about, you know, million, millions. Yeah. You know, and I don't know. USA is not very good at doing the whole entire international thing. We're very good at our domestic sports, but in terms of the international thing, we're, we've been bad for a long time. Like I said, I'm a trackie. So the AAU is my enemy. 
in terms of just the history between track and AAU and even track and the current Olympic committee where one of my favorite runners in the 800 meter wanted to wear a henna tattoo of a sponsor and they told him hell no. And it's like, why? This is where we make our money. You guys aren't paying us anything. So it's when the USA does international stuff, it's not very good. <laughs> They're not great at organizing that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to switch some gears. You're a Red Sox fan. So me and you are kind of mortal enemies because I'm a Yankee. Oh, oh no. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't disparage anybody here. You're not the first Boston uh, representative I, that I've had on this uh, podcast, and you're not going to be the last. But fortunately for me, your Red Sox are not living up to their expectation this year. They're playing right now. I think they're winning, but they're currently 64 and 59. Only five games over 500 at this point, which is mind-boggling considering the team that came back minus your closer is basically the same team. I can't figure out what the hell the Red Sox are doing. Can you? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it has been a rough year. Um, you know, pitching, I mean, our, even, even our, our top guys aren't, aren't having that great a year pitching-wise and our, our bullpen's depleted. Um, you know, Dombrowski, you know, choosing not to pay Kimbrell, you know, is, is a short-term hit probably a, a long-term success. And I, I think his priority is, Hey, I'm running a business here. We're spending a lot of money on our young players. We've got some other young guys coming up. I mean, I mean, Devers, they're gonna have to pay that guy. He's having like a monster year and he's in his early twenties. What um, a game from him yesterday with the six for six and four doubles. Are you kidding me? Oh, he's unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> you know, a power, a power hitter that's hitting for average. That's, that's a lefty. I mean, it's just, it, it's awesome. I mean, it, you know, so long term, the Red Sox are in great, great shape. I mean, they, they've locked up their core unit, got good young guys coming up, you know, just in the short term, that bullpen is just, it's, it's hard to watch, you know, games late, late in innings right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's tough. And that's where you guys can hit with anybody. Mookie has taken a step back, which has surprised me because I thought Mookie was going to really cement himself in as the favorite to win the MVP this year, definitely. And it hasn't worked out the same way with Mookie this year. And it might just be a little bit of a, you know, relapse, like not a relapse, but just kind of a hangover from last year because he's still playing well. He's not playing terrible. He's not playing Mookie level. Um, Right now, they're sitting fourth in the wild card race. They're behind a 72-win team. So that's going to be difficult. Do you see a push in them to get to that wild card point? Because I don't think they're catching the Yankees at 80 wins right now. Yeah, you know, I mean, baseball is a crazy game. I mean, you get, you get late in the year. You know, teams get hot. They get cold. They go on these crazy, you know, win streaks. I mean, it's happened, you know, on – in a good way and a bad way for the Red Sox. I mean, the last – shoot, it feels like the last 10 years were either the best team or the worst team, you know, uh, on any given year. Um, I think with the, the lack of, of strength in the bullpen, it's going to be hard. I mean, my, my impression – you know, of course, I'm, I'm more of a basketball expert than I am baseball. Um, you know, but the, you know, the, the more important a game becomes in either sport, every possession, every pitch becomes a little bit more important. And, you know – in, in that circumstance, I, I think, uh, you know, a weak bullpen is going to get exposed even more. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a little pessimistic with my team this year. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't hear as much blame. I'm in the, with all the New York media. Our managers get blamed when we're doing anything bad. We can have like a bad pitch and our managers get blamed. Callaway and Boone are both going to be, you know, tarred and feathered, ran out of New York. Alex Cora, I don't think is getting that same treatment. I think a lot of people are looking at it and – your GM doesn't get the same treatment where, you know, you criticize them a little, but it's mostly on the players in Boston. If the players aren't doing their job, they're the ones that get the criticism. How do you feel about Cora and the job that he's doing? And do you miss Tito at all? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I do. <laughs> so first of all, he's an Arizona guy. He was my, uh, so my, my, uh, my uncle was a catcher at U of A with Francona. That's amazing. And uh, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big Francona fan. Um, yeah, so I wish, you know, he should still be here. Um, but you know, with Cora, I mean, the one thing that, that I would criticize is, you know, uh, before the season started, he, he wasn't pitching guys many, many, many innings. Um, and, and they started the season. I think they were a little sloppy. I don't think they were conditioned properly. And I think it, all the guys got off to a slow start and they've never really, you know, they haven't, you know, haven't really been able to pick it back up. Um, but that's the one thing I would be critical of Cora. I mean, as far as, you know, your pitching staff of guys that are clearly talented, that are getting paid, that are in their prime. I mean, you got, you got to look at your, you know, your coaching staff, your pitching coach and whatnot. 
I mean, that's something that I would, I would dissect. Hey, what's going on here? What, what, why are we getting smoked? And it's like, I understand our bullpen. We took a hit. We should expect to take a little bit of hit there just because we don't have quite as much talent. What's going on with our starters? Like we're paying them big money and these guys should be in their prime right now. That, that, that frustrates me a little bit. And uh, that, that's not necessarily, you know, pointing the finger at core and his coaching staff or the players, but it's, it, it needs to be, you know, addressed by somebody. Like, Hey, what's, what's going on here? We need, we need, we need to fix this. Something's not working. Now, the big thing about baseball and a lot of managers, the hits that they're taking is that it's become such an analytics game. Boone gets my, you know, Yankees manager, Aaron Boone always gets killed with basically he's not the manager that the GMs are calling the game and that it's all analytics based. Does Cora fall under that or do you feel he's more of a gut manager? Is he also being controlled by the analytics game? I mean, from what I understand, he's, he's very strong in analytics. I mean, their whole team is. Um, you know, it's funny. I, every summer I always try and convince my wife to watch all the baseball movies. So we watched, uh, we watched Moneyball, I think about a week ago. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, I actually, I'm, I actually think baseball analytics does work. It's a very compartmentalized sport, you know, play by play, pitch by pitch. Um, you know, I think it could be, you know, definitely be utilized a lot more in baseball than it does in basketball. I think, you know, trying to use the same concepts in basketball, it's hard because it's such a fluid sport. Um, but, you know, Cora, Cora, from what I understand, is he's, he follows the analytics pretty closely. Now, have you rewatched Field of Dreams with the announcement that the Yankees and White Sox are playing in Iowa in 2020 at the Field of Dreams field? I'm, I'm, I'm pushing my wife. That's, that's next on the list. I mean, that's it's probably Costner. my favorite movie How of all she time. not like Costner? Like, you have to watch a Costner. Oh, no. Oh, no. She loves the movie. I just, you know, I'm sort of one of these guys. If I like a movie, I watch it like 100 times. So um, she's, she's kind of bored with the, her 25th time. <laughs> oh, I do, too. My wife always goes, I'm tired of this movie. I'm like, I haven't watched it. She's like, you watched it yesterday. I'm like, quiet. Okay. <laughs> right. the TNT plays the same movie every day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but overall, it's uh, funny you touched on analytics and basketball because I feel like we've seen a lot more going in that direction with the three-point shot. That's a totally analytics thing where the percentage of scoring, if you're shooting a whole bunch of threes and winning a game, is higher just from shooting a million threes. And I feel like that's a very analytics-driven thing. And also, small ball seems to be more of an analytics-driven thing where if you have more guys that could shoot more athleticism, you will beat the team that has two clunky big men and three athletic guys. It is is that the evolution of analytics in basketball? And is that kind of as far as it's going to go? Or are we going to see more? Well, well here's my opinion on analytics within basketball. Uh, for, first of all, I, I love analytics. I'm, I'm a big fan of analytics. I just don't th- within basketball, I don't think it should be the end all be all. I think it is a very, very valuable tool. We got to be careful of how much you use it. Um, you know, one, one thing that frustrates me with analytics is when they try to evaluate players, uh, you know, especially coming from Europe or from college, and, and, you know, how they will play in the NBA. It's two different games. It's just, it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, I, I do like what you're saying as far as like, okay, we're, we're using analytics to evaluate how our current team is playing and what we need to focus on, what we need to do differently. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of value there. I just, you know, as opposed to baseball, I mean, I think you can make a lot of big decisions as far as lineups and, you know, player acquisitions, looking at the analytics basketball. I just don't, I don't think that is, is the case so much. Or at least I don't think it should be. And kind of last quick topic, because you are one of the rare college basketball fans that I talk to like big time college basketball fans. I hate the fact that college basketball only is two halves. I think that it hurts the players. I think it doesn't really prepare them for the NBA game in terms of strategy wise. Cause when you're on that floor and you're a point guard or whatever, you're also thinking strategy half to half strategy is different than quarter to quarter. Would you like to ever see the college game go to four quarters or are you a fan of two halves? You know, I've never really, really given too much thought. Uh, you know, I'm just so used to college being the two halves. It's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's just sort of how, how it's been my whole life. Um, you know, selfishly, you know, I spent a lot of time on the road scouting college games. I, I don't know if I necessarily would want them to be longer. <laughs> um, well, I mean, longer may- just, you know, just make them into quarters. Take the same yeah. time. No, the same like, well, it's like high school. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And I, I don't have a strong opinion on it. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be opposed if they wanted to do that. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I don't have a great answer for you. It's, I don't have a strong <laughs> opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just, I don't know. I have a whole theory that the college sports don't prepare anybody for pros. I, I can't, it just, it always annoys me. College likes to change everything almost about the games because they want to be different. And I don't know. Well, I will, I will say this. One thing that does frustrate me with college is, is these schools that always play zone. Um, I mean, from an evaluation standpoint and a developmental standpoint for these players, 
you know, they're not being held accountable. I mean, of course, you know, these, these coaches will, you know, teach their zone offense, um, you know, where these guys are playing hard, but I just, I like the idea of, Hey, can this guy defend? I mean, like, who's your matchup and like, you need to do your job for your team and for yourself and you need to improve. And if you don't, you're going to get exposed as a bad defender. Um, you know, and it's college, you know, really creates, you know, a, a lot of crutches for guys, you know, from a development, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, developmental standpoint on that, on that end of the ball. So you're not a big Bayheim guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I love Bayheim. I just, the, the, the zone, the zone just doesn't do it for me. Uh, but all right, with that, that will close out this episode of Sports Opinions Podcast. With me, Matt Babcock of Babcock Hoops. Matt, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Alex. I really appreciate it. Anytime. And uh, yeah, I think you're doing a really nice job. Keep, keep up the good work. I really appreciate it. Matt, any plugs you want to give social media, Babcock Hoops plugs, anything you want to give, throw it on out there. Yeah, sure. So we have babcockhoops.com you can follow us on twitter at babcock hoops instagram at babcock hoops facebook at babcock hoops um and then i'm matt babcock 11 at, at all three of those two um again thanks again alex and i hope you have a good night i appreciate that and definitely go check out babcock hoops if you are a hoops fan it's a great spot to get insights from legitimate experts not just claimed experts legitimate experts in basketball um again i'm alex cuesta find me on twitter and instagram at a underscore cuesta 30 find sports opinions on twitter at sports opinion 30 instagram sports opinions 30 visit the facebook page and listen to this and all the other podcasts that i've recorded on anywhere you can find a podcast and if you are listening when you're done here please go and rank it five stars whatever best you can and if there is a review area leave me a good review. If you don't like the show, just click exit. Just don't do it. But if you like it, leave me a good review because that only helps push me up so more people can discover this and they can hear great guests like Matt who deserve to be heard. So I really appreciate everyone listening. Again, this is the Sports Opinions Podcast. Everybody have a good one.